There are times when you just have to let your inhibition go and let the road take you wherever it leads. I've lived by the rule of the roads for quite some time and it has taken me to so many wonderful places all around Bhutan. This time around, the road has finally led me to the southeasternmost part of the country, the subtropic Zonkug of Samrup Jonkar. As I travel through this road, leaving my ephemeral trace of my existence within the crevices of this ancient mountain known as Melonbrock, I wonder in amazement of how people crossed this treacherous mountain back in the day. I get my blessing from this Guru Babaji for my safe travels and head to my first destination within Orongewog, a wonderful village of Wuling where the people have taken up the zero waste policy initiated by His Holiness Songsa Kense Rinpoche. This village is supposed to be the first in Bhutan to take up such a project in lieu with the nation's philosophy of gross national happiness to see if clean environment equals to a sense of happiness and community. So it's a beautiful morning here in Wuling Village, here in Orong Gyewak in Samrup Jonker, and I'm here with the Levit Sokpa, and it's a beautiful, beautiful morning. We spent the night here in his house. Uh, he has been kind enough to give us shelter, and today he's gonna take us around Wuling Village and show us around and show why this village is so unique. That's all. Um, Yarjebu, <laughs> Um, hangi la um, shungdang misir gani, cha juli ani rang ke um thaga, wata buan sak tu rub ni ada kela rangi buni um, lekne malikne bro atur ge ani, cha juli kena mana sir? Wuling village wasn't always a village as we see it now. It used to be a place where the cattle were sent to graze, but slowly people started settling within this area to be closer to their domestic animals, as it was easier. An interesting belief shared by the villagers is that the name Wuling has been derived from this giant jackfruit tree right in the center of the village. But the settlement of the village where the cattle grazed had brought them much happiness and prosperity and it had turned out to be a good idea. Today, Wuling village enjoys much prosperity through milk business all 49 households that make up Wooling Village do milk business and combined, they produce about 200 liters of milk daily. And it seems that people are happy with their lives, living in this clean environment along with a strong sense of community. <laughs> But more than that, Wuling Village is known for their zero waste policy to the rest of the country. This policy was initiated very recently, yet it is already taking the country by a storm with its success. <laughs> Kuma nila um chani ke o 
taji tuk tani halo ke gini menang tak ada mau sholat. Om malah kami rok di gua tni rana sosoga tajir jong dari pini zom dari pini pila kami. Om uru sajang ke nama semi cilu giola lah. Mau ngapa nama semi giola? Cilu giola. Oh lah giola lah. Udu ya dikit nama semi ah dah lagi. Dang baji godin butap cah. Ni pagar uta gawe sokpa. Ki jepjur. Gabu ki lela gawe tak cungke. Gabu ki caru nang ni. Om masak po leke jipsi bani nang dinja ani juli gila juli lah sola. Mas tu sar um, um show nang pinema pinema bedang pun hamu gigi cak tahu ani cuma jana sar tak. You just look around the village, it's amazing. I almost secretly wish I could settle here myself, maybe because truly is that beautiful. So it's a really, really good thing how like wherever I go, each household is uh, really uh, taking this initiative to their heart and really uh, doing their part. And as you can see here, uh, they're separating their garbage, uh, plastic bags where they're supposed to be, plastic bottles where they're supposed to be, and papers. They're separating all of this. And at the end of the month, they uh, collect this and put this in the storage room. And uh, it's amazing how this small village here in Orongewok, uh, Wuling Village, is uh, taking this initiative and really uh, preserving our environment. If we could only do that in our big cities like Tempu City and Punsaling and even some uh major cities, uh, you know how clean it would look. Our, our environment would be so much cleaner and uh, just looking around this village, I mean, you don't see any trash because the people are taking initiative. It starts from the grassroots level, from the family, from each household. And if you could only do that in the big cities, uh, it would make our lives, or our country, that much better. Lebe Tsokpa then decides to show me the village Lagong, situated on the top of the hill, overlooking the village. Samte Choling Hagong was built in 1936 by the people of Wuling, in a happy village where people work together as a community. This Hagong plays a vital role in celebrating their success once a year in their annual Techu. So it's quite uh, amazing because, uh, I mean, this Hagong is just situated on top of the hill overlooking the entire beautiful village of Wuling. And, uh, Unfortunately, I mean, the Hagong has been uh, slightly damaged by the earthquake, recent earthquake, but they have managed to uh, fix it up, most of it, they've uh, fixed up the roof and stuff, uh, so um, it's amazing, and they have an annual Teichu, annual festival here every year, and it's a beautiful thing, and uh, the Uzin is also telling me that most of the youth also participate, uh, uh, they also come here and enjoy the Teichu, uh, and besides the Teichu, they also come here and get their blessings, prayers, every other uh, day or so, so, which is really beautiful. I mean, this entire village uh, ob overlooked by this amazing, beautiful, sacred hagong. Um, it's a beautiful thing, you know, you, you have this small little village uh, and it's amazing how the community is working together. Uh, kids, adults, uh, government officials, and a caretaker of uh, this um, zero trash, uh, you know, it makes the entire community so much uh, better, beautiful. So it's really, really amazing. kind of just looking at the village one more time it's it's kind of sad that that I'm I'll be leaving tomorrow uh, I mean I've just started my journey of some junker and I don't want to leave this village just but it's a but it's an amazing start it's it's a good start you know it's a it's a start with a warmth in my heart and um, this is a perfect example of a village here in Bhutan especially here in some junker that we could all follow and I hope to see more of this type of village here in Samrup Jonker and uh, you know sad but I'm quite eager to even uh, experience other villages other places in Samrup Jonker
Daewathong is a small town situated 18 kilometers from Samrup Jonghur town. It was also the site where, in 1884, the last battle with the British was fought. Jigmi Namgyal, the father of the first king, Gongsar Ugen Wangchu, who led the Bhutanese troops, put up a strong resistance against the British, though he ultimately signed the Treaty of Singchula with the British in 1865. Today, this small town happens to be the biggest milk corporate in the country. But I want to see how the milk business has a direct benefit to the farmers. So I decide to follow the milkman who collects fresh milk daily from villages around Dewathong. Along my trail following the milkman, I'm welcomed by an elderly couple who wanted to share their success story within the milk business. This eccentric couple has a sweet and a humble beginning. She was a nurse working in the hospital and he was a driver transporting goods from some Junker town. They fell in love, married, and started their milk business with only one cow. With persistence and hard work, today they have become quite successful, owning some acres of land, built two houses, and many cows that produce a handsome amount of milk. They were so eager to show off their cows to me, Hard <laughs> And Puraging am yang zoom pentok pala. Ma pelik pun kau lah. Ama nami sami lay fiola ni. Ta. Fiola lah. Bye bye lah. Ayo las lah ma. Wow, so that was quite interesting uh, here in Dewathong village and. Uh, the milk business has really, really benefited this. Odo ama, odo. It has really benefited them, and I have this jolly uh, um, Madam Youngzom. Uh, she was a nurse, uh, and now she owns two houses just by starting milk business, and this has really, really helped them. And she's quite jolly, very, very. I'm, I'm so happy that I got to meet uh, Madam Youngzom, and. It's been fantastic. She's been quite nice and uh, she's asked me to come the next time I'm here. So I'll definitely come visit her. This has been a fantastic, fantastic uh, uh, experience for me. Right above Dewathong, about 20 minutes drive, is where the Choki Getso Institution for Buddhist Studies is located. 
and I'm heading there because I've heard of a unique course they offer to the young monks besides their normal religious studies. The main hagong is still under construction and what's unique about this hagong is that the architecture is a combination of Tibetan, Chinese, Ladakhi and Bhutanese architecture put together. I'm going to meet Miss Noah, an American English teacher, and spend a day with the young monks in her class. So Noah, um, why did you decide to come to Bhutan and especially to the sh Shedra here in Samri Jongkar area, Deothong? Um, well, I work for Dzong Sir Kansi Rinpoche, okay. and it's his plan, it's his idea, okay. so um, I came because of that, yeah. Okay, where are you from uh, originally? Um, from, I grew up in Colorado, okay. but I spent my summers in New York City. Ah, okay. <laughs> so do you like Bhutan? Yeah, I love Bhutan. Okay, how long have you been here? Um, I first came in 2002 to work okay. on Travelers and Magicians, and I came back a few times, but then I, I've been full-time for the past about three years. Okay. So you've been here how long now? At the Shedra, I've been here only since the end of uh, October, so five months or so. Five months and so. So what do you do here exactly? I'm teaching the monks okay. <laughs> and creating a curriculum. Okay. Yeah. It's not an ordinary English class. What's interesting is that these young monks learn English through a variety of activities. They first start their day with meditation. What is your name? Yeah. My name. My yes. name is Sangye Chokhal. Where are you from? I'm from Tempo. Show and tell session with useful things made from recycled trash where the young monks are made to explain their items in English. What is it? It's big. It's a bag? Yes. Okay, and then the other one? It's a table. It's a table? Yeah. How did you make the legs? I made my marker pen. With marker pen? Yes. Ah, very creative. This broom. My marker pen. Show us everything. The handle is the marker pen? The handle is marker pen. Very, very sweet. Thank you. Miss <laughs> Noah also has them learn English through a gardening session. The young monks grow their own food source as well as learn English. Who would have thought learning English would be so much fun? Yeah. The soil looks really, really rich, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's looking really good. So I think maybe in maybe two more weeks, yeah. we'll have a Couple lot of good soil for the garden. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> See, this kind of plastic, the lychee, yes, yes. this is one of the least Degradable, really not degradable, and not recyclable. I'm really enjoying my time here with, uh, with the monks here. Uh, we had an English class and now we are having a gardening class. Uh, and, and the fact that they're, this is totally um, organic with the with this zero waste policy. Uh, they make their own compost and you know, this is beautiful, uh, a group of uh, monks. You know, this is this is a different class than any other drasongs. Uh, they they get to experience different things, uh, and the fact that they're learning English is a beautiful, beautiful thing. Um, and they've planted chilies, and the chilies have already started growing. So they're learning different things. They're learning English through doing uh, gardening, and it's a brilliant idea by Miss Noah. And um, I've yet to talk to her about the English class and why she decided to teach English here. In uh, some uh, in some of Jonker, they were some, but this is beautiful. This is a good experience. I 
I had a grand old time here. Uh, the little monks, they're so excited about learning English. They're so excited about learning uh, how to plant different, different vegetables. And, uh, you know, they're more open. Uh, unfortunately, I only got to spend uh, today with them, only one day with them, so, uh, which is kind of sad. But if, if I get to stay here maybe a little bit longer, then maybe I get to, uh, I'll get to talk with the monks and they'll open up more. But you know how it is. I'm always on the move. So. But regardless, this was a grand old time. I enjoyed the time. It was the uniqueness of it uh, was a different experience for me. Leaving the Shedra behind, I head towards Samrup Jonker town, the main commercial center for Samrup Jonker Zonkug, as well as for all the eastern Zonkugs. It takes just about an hour drive from Dewathong, and the ride these days are quite pleasant due to the improved expressway. And of course, the heat is unbearable. So I'm finally here in Samrup Jonker town and the sun is blazing. It's really, really hot and uh, they say Samrup Jonker is the little sister of Pun Siling. So I'm here to find out what Samrup Jonker town is all about. Samrup Jonker town is one of the oldest in eastern Bhutan and has seen gradual development over the years. It is a bustling small town with shopkeepers and hawkers from nearby border of Assam. The town also serves as a regional head of Samrup Jonker district and the largest town in eastern Bhutan, although Monger town puts up a good competition. So I'm here in the middle of Samrup Jonker town and it is blazing hot. It's about 12 o'clock in the afternoon and the sun is at its highest and uh, for someone like me who's coming from the north, the heat is unbearable. This is insane. I don't know how the people from Samrup Jonker could take this. Uh, but then again, you look around and you don't see much of the people, much of the Bhutanese people. They're probably hiding away in their homes with their fans on and their ACs on. You see a lot of uh, Indian laborers, especially because Samrup Jonker town is a border town. And uh, they're quite busy. But you know what? In this blazing heat, I'm going to go meet a group of young boys. And they have a band called E-Chorus. And they're going to show me some good times here with some music. And let's go jam. Kuzumbo guys, E chorus, right? Oh, yeah. All right, what's hey, your name? I'm Johnson. Johnson, nice yeah. to meet you, man. It's nice been a while, you. huh? Right? Hi, I'm Shay. You Shay? Ah, it's been a while, man. How are you? Yeah, my name's Maitarai. Maitarai, yeah. all right, man. Keep jamming, man. Yeah. I heard you guys from like right over there, and you know, it sounded really great, so I walked over here. Come on, keep jamming. Let's see what you guys got. <laughs> So I'm here in the middle of Samri Jonker town and I'm here with the famous E Chorus. I mean, I hi. love you guys' music, guys. Say hi to the camera. <laughs> hi. <laughs> Yo, Sim, what's up, man? So, music. music, man. Why do you like music? It gave me like kind of different life to me. Music oh, gave wow. me different life. It it like uh, kept us like together okay. since eight years or ten years, I think. All of you guys. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so that's the one common thing yeah. that you know that you all all four of you guys yeah. have. Yeah. Unfortunately, Titus is not yeah. here, but you know it's you guys still meet him, right? Yeah. Every yeah. once in a while, right? Sometimes, yeah. See, and you get that music brings you guys together, yeah. right? It's something that you guys all love doing. Yeah. Uh, we are planning as a ticket. Take the music as a career, but uh, we have got a lot of troubles and we have got a lot of supporters also. You see, no sponsors, a lot of trouble we are taking. But also, we are trying our level best okay. to upgrade the music. 
So do you, I mean, you guys are already playing uh, music, you know, I know you guys have released an album, right? Yeah. I mean, do you guys plan to play music in the future? Yeah, we have planned. We'll, we'll, like, even if we fail several times, we'll not, like, give up, you know? Okay. The only, like, uh, aim we have in Samsung is we don't have studio. So we are aiming to open a studio for, like, youth, uh, Eastern people who, who have interest in songs and, you know, they can contact us and, like, we can work together. Okay. So we have that aim. That's a really, really good idea. Yeah. So, like, people from Taishigang, Monger, yeah. uh, all the eastern yeah. side, yeah, I mean, the people. youth from these yeah. eastern places, they could all join and come here. Yeah. So, here's to you, Jumbo Lexo by E Chorus. Take it away, guys. All right, guys. All right, that was a, a great number, man. <laughs> awesome. Did you guys hear that? So let's so let's so jumba let's so shoot to all you guys there. All right, Jung Sim, it was uh, very nice meeting you guys and you know just jamming out with you guys. It was a whole lot of fun, and hopefully I'll see you guys next time as a whole band with Titus, right? And we'll jam out once again the next time I hear I'm here in Samrup Jungkar. Thanks, guys. Thanks for supporting. Oh, of course. Bye, guys. Being a border town, Samru Jonkar has been long trading with the Indian state of Assam. And there is one particular place that is famous for dealing with Bhutanese customers. So I decide to visit Budama to see what the fuss is all about. Budama is a typical Indian town where the streets are packed with vehicles, people and shops selling all sorts of goods and junks, giving that aura of chaos that is comfortingly Indian in its nature. Do you ever wonder where you can get things? 
really cheap, fast, and easy. Well, you come to Gudama and you could get, whoopsie, you could get phones if you want phones. You could get colors if you want colors. And if you're in a hurry and traveling, you could also get a suitcase. So hey, why go anywhere else? Come to Gudama, the best place to shop and the best place, friendly place, beautiful place to shop. I meet this gentleman who has been making metal pots for making ara his entire life. And an interesting fact about these people is that this trade is passed down through the generation and it will be the one and only job that will feed his family. Hundred percent he caters to the Bhutanese market. I mean he has kiras, women's kiras to bura kapne, and you could get this for uh, probably at a cheaper price than if you compare it to uh, prices in Timpu. I mean, it'd be a... Uh, I went up 1953. Namaste. Uh, this is quite amazing. It's, uh, you know, like us Bhutanese and Indians, they, we have had this relationship. He's selling even our fathers and mothers and grandfathers have been had a relationship. Their kids have grown up with our own Bhutanese kids. So we're almost like family. This relation we have with India is beautiful because they benefit by selling us, selling us the, yeah. the raw materials and we benefit by making these things. So this relationship is amazing uh, and it should keep going forever because it's beneficial for both of us, both us Bhutanese and Indians. So this is also, I mean, they're, they're our big brothers and we're almost like family. So this is, this is, this is very, very nice. This is uh, amazing. Leaving the hustle and bustle town of Samrib Jonghar behind, I head towards my final destination. The drive takes me about three hours to reach a simpler and peaceful village of Punsothong. And the heat is still lingering like a buzzing housefly right by your ears. This is my first time ever seeing an elephant this up close. This gentle creature is gigantic. Punsothong is surprisingly beautiful, a flat stretch of land that stretches as far as the eye can see. And the people are hospitably welcoming. This place is known for their fishing business, which started in the late 80s. And I speak to some of the locals as they tell me of how much of a benefit fish had on their lives. I'm met by the local fishery Tokpa, Mr. Sangchung, who decides to show me the fish ponds owned by practically each and every villagers. 
It seems that fish business has become quite successful in this village. Here in Punsotang, um, in Dunkerling here, the people are really, really hard working, you know. Uh, they've uh, developed this, uh, they've um, understood the benefits of fishery and uh, it has helped them out so much and this is the reason why they work so hard. Uh, by selling fish, you know, they could put a roof on top of their houses, they could send their kids to school and, uh, you know, this, it's their livelihood and it's, it's an amazing thing that people work so hard for that just to, uh, to have a living, really, necessarily. But, but it's simple and I, I like the fact that it's simple and people just enjoy, uh, although it's hard work, people have a deeper appreciation for this type of thing and uh, me being here in this particular place and just interacting with people and seeing what people do, I have a deeper appreciation for this type of work and how people survive by doing this kind of work. So it's a beautiful thing if you really think about it. Punsothang, at a deeper glance as I explore, has a certain charm to it. A typical southern village, but they enjoy this rare flatland, unlike the rest of the country. Betel nut trees are abundant, giving it a feel of an island somewhere in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Just a glance at the people sitting by their fields, engaged in their everyday chores, somehow resonate a sense of calm and peace in your heart and mind. But I digress. The reason I came here is to fish and how successful they are with the fishing business. I want to get down and dirty, dive into the pond and catch some fish. So uh, this is uh, Fishing 101 here in Pemathang. Uh, here in uh, Samruk Donker. I hope you'll catch a lot of fish. This is hard work, but this is kind of fun. This is fishing, guys. That was really, really exciting. Uh, quite an adventure. Uh, um, my entire waist is uh, down, covered here in the pond. Uh, it's kind of cool in a hot sunny day and I've never seen this many fishes uh, at a sitting like this. Uh, now that's a big fish. Check this out. Now what kind of fish is this? So uh, uh, this is a Rahu. Rahu. Rahu, which we call it in major name, that's Indian that's major cup. In the major cup, and it is around uh, 12 months old. 12 months old. Uh, 12 months culture period okay. inside the fish pond. Okay. So uh, at 12 months, yes. it attains around 800 to 900 grams, or uh, or bigger than one kilo. Plus in 12 months. Now is there? Now this looks kind of different. What kind of what kind of fish is uh, this? One? Yeah, yeah. This is called a uh, silver cup. Silver, uh, carp. silver carp. In major name is called a uh, Chinese, uh, Chinese, uh, Chinese carp. Okay. Bye, bye, little fishes. To their new home here in the pond, and uh, they'll grow big and fat, and then they'll be sold and eaten. We've seen the fishing, we've done the fishing and the villagers here, they've uh, uh, cooked us a beautiful, beautiful meal with the local fish and you know what, hospitality wise, there's no question 
uh, about hospitality here because the villages here, I mean, they're amazing. They cooked us this amazing, beautiful dish with fish. Uh, there's uh, fish curry here with, uh, with soup, uh, fried fish. My mouth is already watering. Um, wow, I'm just gonna dig in, I'm, I'm speechless. Definitely have to come back here another time. That's all. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. That's all. Nami sami kari che te na punso tang te naigi katoto kito to be te naigi. Nami sami kari che sabji. Nami sami same gai la. That's all. Te shule jeni email mi la. That's all. That's all. Let's go, hola. Let's go. A little further from Punsothang is yet another flat stretch of land, and this village is called Dunkerling. This place is known for having people from all over Bhutan in the resettlement scheme, and they're happy and made it truly their home. These three students are practicing a rare chum known as Achalame chum. It was originally danced in Bhutan by the people of Shinkar Lauri. This chum is one of the sacred chums of Guru Rinpoche, danced during his reign to subdue evil spirits and demons. And today, these students, in their newfound home, are trying to preserve a tradition passed down by their ancestors. <laughs> Zimuzim <laughs> I have to say that I must be quite blessed because I had the rare opportunity to witness this chum performed by the students in their original costumes. Wow, they look amazing and I'm even more excited. I've come all the way here to Punsothang to witness this special chum. Usually there's five people that usually performs this dance, but unfortunately two of the members have gone for further education. Nonetheless, only three will be performing and it's still an amazing, amazing treat for me. And I uh, can't wait to see them perform this amazing, amazing sacred chum of Guru Rinpoche. Uh, my journey might end here in Dunkerling of Samrup Jonkar, but you know what, it's a new beginning for them and uh, it's an amazing uh, thing to just witness that this tradition is being kept alive by these young boys and I can't emphasize, stress enough how lucky I am to be here and this is 
such a great, great ending to my journey uh, as I witness this sacred chum. So I'm gonna get back to the chum and just enjoy and bask in this moment of glory almost. The road may turn left or right, but without stereotyping, let the bends of the road take you seamlessly. And more often than not, it opens up a rare opportunity to witness wonderful places like Wooling Village, to learn a lesson on harmony and community. A lesson on love and how it just doesn't happen, but involves much persistence and hard work for it to flourish like these eccentric couple from Dewathong. A lesson on how curiosity in the young minds could lead to many discoveries, reminding us of always keeping an open mind and heart. Sweet sound of music that can bring together people from all walks of life, bringing a pitch perfect melody in the soul that inspires. Teach a man to fish and he will feed his family for a lifetime. But teach a man to raise their own fish and he will feed his family for generations to come. But all these lessons in life are meaningless unless one holds respect for one's identity, culture, and roots. And seeing these young students holding on to what is truly theirs gives a sense of hope for all of us. So until next time, in another Zonkug, goodbye.